have a very interesting program for these Wednesday evenings, and we hope that it will prove useful in several ways, not only in the interpretation of dreams, but also as a means of explaining certain waking phenomena, which perhaps is more frequent to us than the dream itself. To begin with, we have a long history of the study of dream symbolism. From the very dawn of our record of human achievement, dreams have been recorded. And among ancient and primitive societies, one of the duties of the priest or the spiritual leader of the people was the interpretation of dreams. From what we can gain in general, it would seem that in, the, in these culture groups, the dream was regarded as a genuine psychic phenomenon and was assumed to have meaning. Meaning for these people was a rather literal thing. It had to do with daily occupation and daily problems. It had certain prophetic dimensions. And it was also held to be a link between the world of the living and the invisible universe which surrounds man. The Greeks started out with very much this point of view. Democritus, whose reputation has been closely associated with his discoveries in the field of atomism, held that the dream represented man's sensitivity in the sleeping state to shadows, both elements and substances floating in the air perhaps even derived from the consciousness of other persons. He held that space was filled with bodies, many of them fragmentary and gradually disintegrating, that in sleep man had some participation in this chaotic sphere, which was a sort of psychic graveyard. Aristotle, always a more conservative man, in fact, he came to be regarded as the very embodiment of a conservative mental viewpoint, was inclined to suspect that dreams arose within the individual himself, due to psychological factors in his own nature, or from environmental pressures affecting his personality and his rest. Cicero liked to think that dreams were prophetic, except those after heavy meals, which he doubted to have a divine origin. Plato probably can be summarized as taking the position that dreams were a form of communication between the internal life of man as his soul or psychic content and his external or physical existence as this was seated in the brain. We do not have too much additional material contributed during the medieval period where the churchmen who dominated were inclined either to follow Aristotle or Plato. But within the last three or four hundred years, many philosophers took an interest in dreams very often as a means of sustaining other broader theories with which they were concerned. Gradually, their opinions moved toward those now generally held. But we may admit, uh, without reservation, that even today the dream is not fully understood, nor the processes by which it is produced. It is still much of a mystery. Our word dream, for 
from medieval English, from the German, and from old Teutonic roots, seems to come from a word which means to deceive. So that at a very early time in European culture, certainly, man doubted his dreams and began to consider them as the production of some kind of fantasy, not entirely within the boundary of reality. Thus, in the last 4,000 years, we may say that man has gradually drifted from the belief that a dream was a factual, actual experience occurring in another region or in another dimension of space, drifting through modifications of this concept, to the final conclusion that the dream was intimately associated with the internal life of the individual. This is a broad statement and is subject to some modification, but for our purpose it will indicate the general direction of thinking. The next problem that arises is the content of dreams. And this, perhaps, is the closest to our immediate interest. From the beginning of our observation of dream phenomena, we observe that it is composed very largely of symbols. And gradually it has come to be assumed that a study of symbolism is one of the most simple and direct ways of approaching the interpretation of dreams. Symbolism itself has been so long a part of man's cultural heritage that it may be regarded as one of his oldest and deepest traditions. Symbolism has been associated with life since man began to speculate upon his own origin or the origin of other things. Symbolism also has developed among most peoples into a highly organized legendary or lore, and also into a strong moral ethical conviction, uh, so that symbolism has come to be regarded as a legitimate means of interpretation by which we seek to discover substances or realities under the surfaces of appearances. Some of the medieval thinkers took the attitude that all appearances, all things visible, are symbols of things invisible, and not in their own natures available to us. Therefore, that we must examine the whole universe in terms of symbolism if we ever hope to understand the operations of universal law. This law in itself, formless, manifests its will or its way through an infinite diversity of forms, and that these forms are meaningful purposeful, have reasons for their existences, and are in some way extensions of principles, which are also valid. These conclusions man has broadly accepted, and with this acceptance he comes into a useful instrument for the interpretation of his own thinking. Now the symbol descends to the average person through tradition. Whether we realize it or not, we are not only constantly confronted with symbolism in our daily living, but it has come into our consciousness, through our association, through our reading, through our religion, through our arts and sciences, and through practically every specialized agency of cultivation. Those in various walks of life have developed intense symbolisms around familiar things, as the agriculturist, or the mechanic, or the metal worker. Uh, to the physician, the world is a series of symbols, originating in the great processes of biology and physics. Disease manifests itself through symptoms, and symptom is another name for symbol. It is a kind of symbol a symbol manifesting itself through a process or through a moving circumstance in the structure of the individual. Now, in recent issues of our journal, we have been 
publishing a series of articles on the symbolism of birds, animals, and other creatures which are around us in nature. Now, these articles will be very useful in the study of dreams because we instinctively now associate even these common and generally accepted creatures as having meanings other than obvious meanings. We gain considerable help in this in rhetoric. And even the dictionary is a very valuable aid, because nearly all words have two meanings. One a strict meaning, and the other a meaning by extension. The strict meaning uh, may not be so useful, but the meaning by extension is itself little less than a dream interpretation. Wherever words move into symbolic usage, they have come to be so accepted in our own consciousness. We think, for example, of the word stream, and by perhaps its most common and familiar meaning, we visualize a mountain stream, a rivulet of water, coming down from the hills. But in the dictionary, we will find that this word has already received its extensions. We may now speak of a stream of thought, or a stream of events, or a stream of circumstances. Thus our word has come to convey a flowing of ideas, or a flowing of values, rather than of simply a flowing of water. We also think of the word storm, and our strict meaning would involve natural phenomena. But we also think of storm now as a synonym of war, of the struggle of life, of a catastrophe in personal affairs. We think of a storm now as a stormy meeting of the board of directors. We have already extended the meaning into symbolism. We have already bound the basic symbol with a series of related patterns and ideas. And this relationship is a very important clue to the interpretation of dream symbols. Because these relationships arise through our own experiences or through our own mental ability uh, to relate similar things, or things which may receive a similar definition, though of nature and substance they are different. In this same thinking, then, the dream alphabet that we are seeking, and which, in spite of man's best endeavors, has never yet been found, this alphabet almost certainly derives itself from folklore, derives itself from the unusual but natural interpretations that we give to them. Consider the infinite number of such extensions to be found in the Shakespearean plays, where we have a line like this, Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. Here we have winter and summer brought into an entirely new relationship of meaning. Here we have winter as a symbol of discontent, summer of contentment, or of the flourishing of things. A quite right and proper extension, but one probably constantly going on in our own consciousness, where we are forever creating these delightful parallels or analogies between ideas and using them in various ways according to the particular interests or attachments that we may possess. Another and rather parallel situation arises in what we call Argo, a kind of dialectical situation 
We think now of the many trades and professions that have developed languages that are almost completely unintelligible to the uninitiated. The words used are good English words, but they are given different meanings. Meanings which mean that a person with a special interest has found those meanings in words which to others do not have any such connotation. Thus we find in the development of mechanics and crafts and trades that old words come to have new significance, and the old meanings fade away from non-utility. Thus a constant psychological change in term and word is noted throughout our history. Now what does a word do to us? A word can do one of several things. Uh, we may start with the most pronounced negative. A word can do nothing. That is one of its functions. If it does not mean something to us, it remains not only uninteresting, but perhaps unintelligible. Or a word which we receive may cause a word exchange in our own consciousness. Many people who think they are thinking are merely exchanging words with each other. The word of one person suggests a word to the other person, and this suggestion becomes a chain of related words. Everyone has a wonderful time. Everyone feels that the other persons are very congenial, but in the end, no one knows anything more than they did before. This is where words are substituted for ideas. And by this substitution, merely perpetuate themselves but are not carriers for any import or meaning. Another thing that a word can do, and probably should do, is to cause a meaning to rise in our consciousness. We grasp at the word, and the word becomes the symbol of an idea. We therefore release from our own natures, by association, our own knowledge or meaning of that word. And it is because we have the power to remember meanings of words that we are able to converse with each other. For each word that we hear calls forth its meaning from ourselves. Now very often our meaning is not the same as the person who used the word. This leads to what we commonly call misunderstanding which is simply the inability of the person hearing to call forth from himself a definition of what he hears that is similar or identical to the meaning of the person who spoke. But we do know that words become agents to call forth out of ourselves some kind of an animate or symbolic significance. And where they achieve this purpose, we do maintain a fair level of communication. These words, then, are not in themselves so important. They are important merely because they cause us to recollect ideas. And to have these ideas brought from some dark, mysterious, file of the memory and inject it into an immediate situation. We call this stimulation of ideas. Also, we may take several related ideas, and when a person combines in words these ideas in new patterns, we have invention, we have ingenuity or originality. And we prefer these original patterns to rather worn-out cliches with which we are over-familiar, and which therefore do not bring forth from ourselves the satisfaction of immediate new comprehension. This process has its definite relationship to dream existence, because 
We dream for the reason that we have this availability of ideas and to bring them into objectivity requires some kind of an agency, a moving or pressable circumstance, no longer the word of someone else, but perhaps another kind of stimulation. And this we will discuss in a moment. In the meantime, however, we have one or two other small background points which I think are worth making. Dreaming in man is rather well associated with age patterns. We know that the young, the child, does dream. We know also that the dreams of children are rather easier to interpret because they arise from a comparatively small area of stimulation. There are only certain things meaningful to the child, comprehensible to the child, and it only has an elementary group of symbols with which to react to stimulation. In the case of the aged, and due to the delicacy of the situation, we will now say, by the aged, we mean anyone over a hundred years old. But to the older group, the centenarians and so on, dreams also lose most of their vitality in the majority of instances. Dreams among the aged are not as numerous, nor as intense, nor as well remembered. Therefore, we may assume that certain psychological processes associated with age have a tendency to diminish dream intensity. The majority of important dreaming takes place during the period between adolescence and the invasion of age. Therefore, we generally group this into the so-called mature group. Persons of mature years. But there is a grave question as to whether maturity in sense of time has very much to do with it. More likely, it is maturity in sense of activity. The adult person is living a more strenuous and immediate life, particularly in a competitive society. He is under more psychic stress and tension. He is more active and more subject to alternations of success and failure, of hope and despair, he is more afflicted by worry and fear, and in uh, the modern world in which we live, he is considerably agitated by world conditions beyond his power uh, to influence or modify. That this particular group, then, represents the principal dreaming group may well imply that the dream arises as the personality becomes more complex and more laden with the productions of its own actions and reactions. We can carry this thought a little further into the life of domestic animals. We know that animals dream, and it has been observed that this dreaming becomes more noticeable as the animal ascends the scale of intelligence. We also know that dreams are more uh, frequent in animals with active lives than those with sedentary lives. The family lap dog has not been a consistent dreamer, and his dreams, if he has any, appear to be comparatively moderate. Occasionally he will flick a leg in his sleep or appear to be munching a particularly fine bone. But otherwise we do not see too much dream symbolism. The hunting dog, however, will nearly always show strong marks of dream excitement after a hunt. The dogs which are engaged as, for instance, police dogs in various services for man or seeing eye dogs that have to fight with traffic to protect their masters 
and develop apparently a very keen sense of canine responsibility. These kind of dogs dream more frequently. Thus responsibility, or the sense of sharing, or of urgency, or of hazard, as experienced consciousness, these seem to affect the unconscious state of the animal. Another point that perhaps might be made in passing is the uh, relation of dreams to those who are in one way or another curiously afflicted. It is not as yet demonstrated that persons born blind have visual dreams. The tendency is definitely to suggest that they do not. That where they do have dream experiences, these dreams take other forms, making use of symbolism in areas where sensory perceptions are still available. This is not true, however, if the individual becomes blind, after once having become aware of the world around him. It is also true that persons who are born deaf are not known to have dreams involving speaking of words or other phenomena with which they are not familiar. It is reported that after Helen Keller had been taught to speak, artificially of course, but still to speak, that uh, speech began to occur in her dreams. Prior to this time, prior to her own experience of speech, they, uh, this did not occur in her dreams. Uh, points of this kind continually point up or indicate some valid relationship between phenomena as experienced by the senses and the mysteries of sleep phenomena as we record them in dreams. The next point, perhaps, that we should try to clarify is the level of man's reaction to dream pressures. Dream pressures are now generally regarded as of two kinds. Those which arise in the environment around man, by means of which his rest is in some way partly disturbed, and certain association mechanisms begin to function within his own otherwise sleeping consciousness. And dreams which are essentially of internal origin, arising distinctly within the individual, and therefore not in any way validly related to immediate circumstances around him. But undoubtedly many of these dreams are ultimately related to circumstances around him. Dreams which arise almost entirely from external circumstances are such as would naturally accompany the disturbance of rest. The uh, tendency today is to include such dreams as may arise from digestive difficulties in this grouping, uh, perhaps because the major enemy or the main cause of the dream did come from outside, perhaps in the form of mince pie or broil lobster late at night. In any event, however, these dreams which have a physical or mechanical origin seemingly are regarded as essentially environment-produced dreams. Those, however, which arise with no direct relationship to any immediate circumstance may more likely be attributed uh, to the individual's internal life. And those arising from the internal life may also be divided into at least two classifications. And here we get into rather confusing ground because there are innumerable groups of classifications suggested. But for our present purposes, I think two will cover our needs. Uh, the first of these groups would arise from the individual taking his daily activities into rest with him. Therefore, the dream, in most cases, can be directly traced, if not to the circumstances of the preceding day, at least to a series of pressing circumstances which have occurred recently, or which represent 
the natural, probable human reaction to fear or worry or tension or stress or anxiety of some kind. The second type of internal dream would appear to be considerably detached from these considerations and may be regarded as indication of the pressures of basic temperament. What the individual is begins to press itself upon his awareness. Therefore, the two internal groups can be said to be composed of what the individual is and the result of what the individual does. These are now held to explain most dream phenomena. Uh, I think it is wise, however, to consider the possibility of a minor reclassification. I think we may include uh, as environmental dreams all dream phenomena which arises from environment, whether immediate or remote. Whether it be something brought forward from childhood or something which has occurred within the last few hours before sleep. All of these generally belong to one classification, broken up into time groupings. The second class, or internal dreams, would seem to be that type which has no essential relationship to any immediate event or even a known remote event, but seems to be the exercise of the temperament or essential nature or individuality of the person, who is in this case explaining or interpreting himself or bringing himself to bear upon the circumstances which affect him. So we have the dream arising from the circumstance and the dream arising from the individual seeking to meet or interpret circumstance from his own resources. The dreams in these classifications can, of course, be added, uh, be added to in several ways. We still have a whole group of dreams of a prophetic or mystical nature which are not fully understood. The materialistic psychologist wishes to classify them with the general body of dreams, assuming that they are only a specialized type of reaction to the pressures of circumstances. The mystic, however, is inclined to feel that the mystical dream or the mystical experience in itself is valid that it represents a direct contact with some superior level of intelligence or consciousness, but that this contact takes upon itself the familiar dream symbols in the process of moving into objective awareness. Therefore, the symbolism may not be essentially different, but the level and quality of the meaning behind the symbol that can be, in many ways, modified or changed. Research in this field, as might be expected, is not abundant. But there is an increasing interest in it, and more tendency to become concerned about it. Also in the general heading of environmental dreams, a new factor has been imposed in recent years in the study of atomism and in the development of electronics and related sciences. The possibility now of universal pressure upon the individual, or universal chemical processes, electrical or magnetic, may affect the individual and cause a kind of dreaming, which is not related either to the ordinary environment or to the individual's own psychic content. This may open a comparatively large field of research and uh, is beginning to take considerable significance in our thinking. Another phase of our dream problem, which perhaps will have to be ultimately explored, is the relationship between the dream, per se, and what we call daydreaming. Whether we know it or not, we are constantly playing with symbols, whether we are asleep or awake. And when we misunderstand our neighbor, 
and turn bitterly upon him and blame him for something which was not his meaning. We are actually involved in the same process as dream interpretation. We are actually dreaming awake because we are calling forth these symbolic shadows and attempting to use them in the grasping of ideas. Daydreaming, of course, has as its fundamental uh, principle a kind of escape mechanism. The daydreamer is a person trying to live in a private world, not getting along too well in the public regions in which he abides. He decides that it would be more pleasant, more comfortable, and in his own thinking, better for him to invent a world. And he invents it as diligently as the story of Gulliver's travel uh, represents an invention. He invents a world in which he is always right. Now that is a delicious state of affairs. The only difficulty with it is it remains an invention, a delusion, and a snare. Because it assumes something that cannot be assumed, namely that he is always right. Also, in a way, his rightness is associated with certain weaknesses of his temperament. Whatever may be the principal handicaps of his life are always neutralized in the daydream. He finds himself, therefore, always an object of admiration. He is always a perfectly splendid being. He is not only always right, but he is always magnificent. He is also privileged to exercise authorities and freedoms which are not possible in his daily life. So in daydreaming, he develops all kinds of utopias. Uh, based upon almost any subject, from retiring into a monastery in the Himalayas to becoming a beachcomber in Tahiti. Whatever seems to him uh, to bring him freedom from the pressures which affect him and for which he is not able to make adequate compensatory adjustments, whatever gives him then this sense of total sufficiency, is in some way shadowed in his daydream. His daydream can therefore be analyzed uh, to, the, to the end of determining uh, the inadequacies or imperfections of his own psychic processes. And uh, in his daydream, he consciously builds. In his ordinary dream, he unconsciously builds. But in both cases, he is working with the same basic materials. And that which he builds, he will also tell a story of himself. We know the architect by his house. We know the individual's nature by what he seeks to achieve and what he seeks to escape. These may be clearly indicated in his day dreaming or in his sleeping. Also, by nature and choice, man surrounds himself with symbols. He surrounds himself with various emblems or devices, colors, sounds, forms, substances, which in their own ways tell what he is. They may also reveal that which he is not, and they may definitely reveal the areas of tension or stress which are most dangerous for him. If, therefore, we are inclined to read man's sleep symbolism, we should also read with equal interest his daylight waking preferences, those things which most interest him, those things which bring him the greatest comfort, the type of picture he finds congenial, the type of music he listens to, the arrangement and color harmonies or discords of the furnishings of his home, the selection of a model of an automobile, the programs he watches on television or radio, 
uh, lessons to on radio. These things are all symbols of attitudes and processes taking place within his own consciousness. By the law of selectivity in himself, he is constantly seeking to compensate for his deficiencies or to obscure them or to defend himself against them. Also in the problem of dreams and dream symbolism, we know that dreams become increasingly painful or difficult to bear as man slips away from the state of a norm, his own norm, not other people's, and falls into a psychosis of any kind. One of the danger symptoms which each person should watch carefully in his own character is the condition in which dreams become too prominent in his waking life. A person, for instance, who gets up in the morning with his day overshadowed by a bad dream and may require several days to recover from that dream or may desperately attempt to accept something which he has dreamed about as a fact and allow this to influence his conduct while awake. Such a person is not in very good shape, and something should be done, on his own part at least, to gradually correct this condition, because if he allows it to drift too far, he may find that the pressures of his subconscious take over in his conscious affairs, and this could be extremely difficult and dangerous for him. Therefore, if someone has a dream in which a neighbor is unfriendly and doesn't speak to the neighbor for a week afterwards, this is not good. This is truly allowing ghosts to take over. And uh, unless the dream is supported by adequate evidence, then uh, it is not well to allow it to be too influential. I've known cases where a person, having thus had a dream of someone else, and becoming very edgy in the presence of that other person, very unfriendly, and very obviously displeased, has of course caused the other person to react in like manner, and apparently proved the truth of the dream. This, however, began merely as a sleep symbolism which may have had an entirely different meaning from that which is obvious. This brings us then now ahead into the problem of our dream alphabet. And one of the simplest points that we must make at the beginning of this is to remind the individual that the majority of dreams are not to be interpreted literally. Uh, of course, occasionally one will be found particularly a prodromic dream, or one relating to health, in which the individual has a clear premonition of physical difficulty. This type of dream may require or invite a medical checkup. But for the most part, dreams are not to be regarded as literal. This is a sad mistake that most people make, and accounts for the fact that probably in the last 30 or 40 years, I have had several hundred letters from people who had had a dream that a continent was going to sink or a city be destroyed and hastened to inform me that they had had this dream. They were then, of course, I hope, pleasantly disappointed when the city did not disappear or the continent did not sink. They weren't quite able to understand how they could have so clearly seen Detroit go up in smoke, and nothing happened. This was before the age of smog, so we can't blame it on that. But these people tried to assume that particularly a menacing dream, or a dream of disaster, has to be literal. Their thinking, perhaps, is based upon the fact that they have read of cases where persons have had prophetic dreams that were fulfilled and were thus over-influenced in their own thinking. But the majority of disaster dreams are never fulfilled. 
for the simple reason that they were not intended to be regarded as literal stories of a disaster. The disaster described in the dream was of a different type, but the person was unable to make the symbolic adjustment. So it is natural for us to recommend that all dreams be considered symbolical unless other testimonies of an extraordinary nature are present. The symbolic dream always has to be solved by an answer to the question, what does this dream mean to me? This is not an easy question to answer, but essentially it is easier for the person who is dreaming to answer it than anyone else. Because a dream is always a production arising from factors which cannot be generally known and which cannot be completely classified. Certain classifications are possible and we will make some of them. But all dreams have a certain direct individuality. And similar dreams uh, by different persons may have different meanings. That the meaning should be and could be most available to the person who has the dream is only reasonable. Therefore, our best chance of having an adequate interpretation is that the dreamer himself will have at his command a fair area of dream symbol factors in order that he may interpret his own uh, experience, or at least bring certain reasonable values to bear upon it. Now, the basic meanings of dream symbols are surprisingly simple, and although they can be presented in an extremely learned way, we will probably come as close to them in Grimm's fairy tales and Aesop's fables as anywhere else. From the beginning of man's experience, he has formalized certain archetypal concepts in his own consciousness. He has related and interrelated the common factors of daily living. It is now quite possible that some of this information descends to man as part of his common heredity, that it is essentially in his own folk nature. It is part of a heritage that has descended within him as well as around him. The most obvious, simple, evident form of this descent is, of course, around him. And in the circumstance that from early childhood he is exposed to traditional symbolical meanings. He receives them in early stories that are told to him. He receives them in the first grades of school. He receives more of them in Sunday school and he continues to have them imparted to him throughout life in one way or another. There is, however, uh, a certain point we must clarify. Homogeneous culture groups are observed to have their dreams more in common than heterogeneous groups. Thus, a people whose national, religious, and racial existences are actually one existence, will have a much more intense common language of dream symbols. These persons have risen in environments in which meanings were simple and clear and constant, and where all their neighbors and their relatives and their ancestors and their friends have had the same general social experiences and have therefore developed a larger common denominator of symbolism. This does not mean that there will be no deviations in this group, but it does mean that there will be more conformity than in a heterogeneous civilization. Thus, dreams have a traditional factor or element in them. And in our Western life, we have a very unsound or, or insecure traditional background. Our traditions have been derived from many areas, have been seriously broken up, 
have been mingled and intermingled without very much continuity or reason, until today they constitute more or less of a hodgepodge. We have no clear traditional ethics or traditional morality. We have no clear background in our myths and legends and folklore. We are not like the Greeks who had their religion and their philosophy are very closely interrelated. We are not like the Chinese who closed their doors to foreign nations and remained aloof for ages. These people represent a much more homogeneous uh, cultural pattern, deriving all of their alphabetical forms from one common culture. Ours are derived from innumerable conflicting cultures. This, in a sense, enriches the fabric, but it also compounds the difficulty in bringing the essential symbolism uh, within our conscious control. On the other hand, all people, regardless of their areas, have had certain symbols in common. These symbols include particular natural forces. For in all parts of the world, nature is reasonably consistent. It is true that in some areas we have a temperate climate, in others a torrid. These will modify. But all over the world, if a man falls in the water and cannot swim, he will drown. All over the world, an individual who does not eat will be hungry. And all over the world, an individual who is tired goes to sleep. Thus, there are these large common patterns uh, to which we may turn for certain generalities which must then be carefully special. If we use the familiar stories and legends that we know, we shall gradually come into possession of a series of related concepts by means of which we can come into control of a great number of dream symbols. It is not necessary to list all of them because you can sit down yourselves with a piece of paper Put down a series of basic words, and then explore your own understanding of these words. You can take any kind of a symbol, and you can use upon that symbol a little while in terms of extension. You may not arrive at what might be regarded as the classic meaning. In probability, you will not for the reason that the classic meaning would be an absolute norm, and the average person cannot be absolutely normal in his reaction to anything. You will, however, gain not only a general concept, but also perhaps a particularly colored one, suitable to your own needs, and telling you what this symbol particularly means to you. Thus you can take almost anything you can dream about, and you can put down the basic thought, and you can begin to improvise upon this theme. It is almost the same as certain basic word tests, in which you search for word associations. But in this case, instead of seeking for similar words, you seek for related meaning. Well, we'll take a few and try and show you uh, what we mean by this. Let's take a very old and common symbol, a rabbit. Now, if for some unknown reason, or at least unexplained reason, you should in your sleep have the adventure described in Alice in Wonderland, in which this young lady, having gone to sleep, was confronted by a very prepossessing rabbit that not only looked well and dressed well, but also spoke with a distinct English accent. This rabbit became a kind of conductor and led her down into the earth where all her adventures took place. Now, this rabbit symbol, what does a rabbit suggest to your mind? It suggests many different things. One of the things, for instance, that it might very well suggest to you 
is its rapidity, its power to jump. It may also suggest few other habits. When a rabbit is cornered, unable to escape, and does not know what to do, it remains absolutely still, trying through complete suspension of all activity uh, to conceal its identity or its location. Then, of course, we associate rabbits very largely with intense productivity. Uh, rabbits multiply with amazing speed being very successful in this form of mathematics. But we also think of the rabbit as a timid creature. We think of it as perhaps a childhood pet that we have had. Rabbits suggest many overtones. And in a context of symbolism, the more we think about these overtones, the more likely we are to draw out of ourselves the reason why we had a dream involving a rabbit. The pressure in the dream would indicate that in some way this symbolism is significant to us. And by quietly exploring, they also be so divided in their interpretation. Since we may dream of water, we may dream of a beautiful sea, we are either sitting on the shore enjoying the splendor of it, or we are on a safe ship sailing upon it, or we are looking with uh, great pleasure and happiness at a wonderful sunset over the sea. These are sea as friend or friendly symbol. Then we may have the sea as the mischievous symbol, in which we're in a small boat tossed about and become seasick. The sea isn't really doing us a great deal of harm, but it is unpleasant. Or we may find the sea uh, dashing itself against the shore and covering us with spray. Or we may have built a little castle by the edge of the sand, and the sea comes in and destroys it. Here we have the sea as a mischievous factor. Not really evil, but either pleasant or annoying to a degree. Then we have the sea as danger, the great storm, the tidal wave, the terrible inundation. We find ourselves upon the sinking ship, cast upon the waters. We now find the sea is something we have to fight in order to survive, for a little life raft, or that we are struggling to prevent ourselves from drowning, and the great waves break over us, or beat us against the shore. These are the sea as danger. So we may say that all symbols, or nearly all symbols, certainly all in which such modifications are possible within the scope of the symbol itself, all such symbols with their division can and do represent three conditions. The condition of the benevolence of a symbol, the condition of an intermediate uncertainty, containing some benevolence and some that is not so good, and the malevolent meaning of the symbol as danger, hazard, or disaster. In studying dream symbolism, there is certainly a tendency for persons under pressures of various kinds uh, to develop what might be termed uh, disaster dreams. But this situation is not necessarily consistent. We will say, however, that abnormalcy leads to the exaggeration of symbols. That an individual will suddenly come into a situation that is unreasonable in its uh, significance or in its meaning, and therefore shows distinct exaggeration. Another phase of our subject is the combination of symbolic forms to produce monstrosities chimera of one kind or another, or non-existent creatures. This type of dreaming was held to have great religious significance by the ancients. We are now inclined, however, to think that these composite dream entities represent compound dream symbols. And in these compounds, they are somewhat more difficult to determine than in simple patterns. We are also fully aware that the dream situation 
can consist of kaleidoscopic and comparatively dim and uncertain dream pictures. There may or may not be any continuity in a dream. It may seem to unfold as an orderly sequence or pattern of affairs, and when this occurs, the dream is regarded usually as more important. The more clearly defined the incidents are, the more likely they are to be remembered after the dreamer awakens. There are chaotic dreams, however, in which there is nothing but fragmentation, in which things do not take any reasonable pattern. Do not assume any forms with which we can find consistent or connected meanings. Another interesting phase of dream symbol is the frequency with which faces are missing in dreams. We may dream about people, but for the most part we do not actually see these people in their clear and natural appearance. We either have only an impression of who they are, or there is a certain vagueness about persons, whereas other objects may be extremely clear. There is, however, a variation upon this theme, where, for some reason, faces or recognizable likenesses are extremely clear. Then we uh, must assume that there is a specialization involved in this type of dream, a specialization which we will also discuss a little later, but it becomes a certain kind of specialized dream intensity. We, are, we do not generally use persons in their proper forms uh, as dream symbols, because usually we have already interpreted these persons into their symbolic equivalents in our own subconscious. One exception may be, of course, the dream of the so-called celebrated person. The dream of a person, probably not known to us personally, whose likeness has descended to us so clearly in tradition that we almost inevitably identify that person. Usually in these cases, the likenesses which we see are also the traditional appearances derived from art, or from other sources in which such perpetuation is possible. In the case, for instance, of dreaming of Abraham Lincoln, uh, we would almost certainly have a strong symbolic likeness available to us, which might uh, cause definite clarification. The same is true in certain religious dreams, where dreams of Christ and of Mary and of the angels may take on a very clear and definite form. One of the reasons this type of dream is held to be more significant than other kinds of dreams is this very circumstance, this circumstance that the persons involved are extremely clearly etched upon consciousness, this causing a considerable difference to the general type of dream. Having, therefore, certain of these generalities available to us, we can begin to think of various types of common or familiar symbols with which we have certain association. The moment we think of the birds or the animals or the flowers or the trees, let us also think in terms of what these have held as traditional meaning. And in most instances, our own determination of this will answer our question. Because when checking these kinds of lists, it is not surprising to find considerable originality. And the interpretation given by the person may not be the most common one, but the one that was most common to him, or the one which was the natural result of his own attitude toward life. Now, flowers represent a very good example of levels of meaning. Uh, peculiarly because of their relationships with many of the important functions of life. For instance, flowers can and often do represent birth. Flowers represent marriage because they are associated with marriage. Flowers represent remembrance because they are used at seasons for greetings. And then, of course, 
on the more melancholy end, the flowers are associated with the funeral and with death. Thus we have a wide range in flower symbolism as to meaning. And it becomes very important for us to try to estimate, in our own case, how our natural tendency would be inclined to interpret these. Sometimes the key to the interpretation comes to us automatically with the dream itself, or soon afterwards it hits us as what it means, particularly if we can relate it to some circumstance or condition around us which might very well be the cause of such a dream. Then our only problem lies in the determination of our own attitude toward the circumstance as represented by the dream interval. If, therefore, for example, we know that we have taken a certain anxiety to sleep with us, and in the night we have a certain symbolism in the form of a dream, which may or may not appear to relate to the subject, we can, upon awaking, at least consider the possibility that the uppermost anxiety in our mind in some way influenced the symbolic circumstance. And in majority of instances, this will prove valid. Not in every case, however, as there may be a basic urgency beneath the particular experience which has occurred. Now we know definitely, for example, that all dreams which incline psychologically downward, dreams which move from hazard to menace, dreams in which the individual finds himself or feels himself the victim of a condition over which he has no control, the vision or concept of the drowning man, of the individual being constantly beset until gradually his internal resistances are destroyed. We then find the natural tendency of the dream to reveal a kind of total prostration. It is comparatively rare, however, for a dream to carry this frustration to the point of death. The individual may experience drowning, but he does not experience that he has drowned. He experiences falling, but he does not experience that the fall was actually fatal. Therefore, it appears in nature that man is not normally inclined to develop terminal dreaming. He is inclined to develop disaster dreaming, or warning dreaming, that he is falling, that he is in trouble, that he is in disaster. It usually takes very little basic effort to clarify this situation in his thinking. He can begin to estimate the terms of the pressures around him, and he can relate to the general concept that he is being gradually absorbed into a situation over which he has no reasonable control. This dream of impending greatness or vastness which he cannot hope to master or balance, will be found as almost always a sign of extraordinary discouragement. This type of dream, where it occurs, may take any number of, a, of types of situation. A man may dream that he has been bitten by a serpent. It is several miles to the camp where he has snake antitoxin. Every effort is made to prevent him to reach that camp. He feels himself under the danger of death. He feels the poison spreading in him. He is striving desperately to get to this remedy. But uh, obstacle after obstacle delays him. And very often he will awaken in a cold sweat. He will not, however, usually experience the fact that he never got there. Or that the venom was taken. He is simply struggling desperately against this danger. In each person, the symbolism will be somewhat different. But the dream of this struggle to survive a hazard, 
in a thousand different guises and likenesses tells us, usually, the elements of one story. The dreaming itself may give us additional detail bearing upon different personal types of grappling. But wherever this dream of being unable to reach safety, or this dream that something is closing in, waters are rising until finally they will drown us. Darkness is closing in and we are fright like frightened children. Storms are breaking and we have no shelter. All these types of things has to do with the individual's internal loss of hope, loss of sense of ability to survive obstacles. This is generally psychologically adopted to the letting go process in consciousness. The individual gives up this allotment of the love of life. It is being undermined. Something is happening around him which is causing him to fear the loss of his own life. By life, we come again into a very interesting symbol. Because in our dream subject, life is not merely the continuity of the heartbeat. Man symbolically has already extended the meaning of life to include not only physical continuance, but the continuance of the primary purposes of living. When we say a man will live his own life, what we really mean is he will act as he pleases. It has nothing to do with physical continuity. Therefore, a man's life is his work, his dream, his hope, his conviction, his optimism, his faith. It is almost anything by which he feels that vital impulse to continue to endeavor. Where the dream hazards life, it is actually hazarding the purposes of living. And dangerous dreams of this kind arise often where there are frustrations in personal affairs that seem to be hopeless, and to which the individual must either adjust without the loss of this sense of life, well, the dream is telling us that he is giving up, that therefore his ability to perform his various functions properly will gradually diminish unless something is done to correct the situation. So almost any one of many symbols will suggest this, but all these symbols are in one category, basically. And you can probably pretty well sense that the individual who finds himself sinking in quicksand uh, is having a somewhat parallel dream meaning with the individual who finds himself drowning in the sea at night. Now the difference between quicksand and the sea may or may not be important, depending largely upon the individual's analytical interpretation of his own symbolism. It may mean simply the common sense of the loss of self-existence. But it may also suggest uh, different types of danger. The quicksand problem nearly always implying that the person believes that he was on firm ground. Then he is caught in a situation which is unexpected and finds himself slowly being destroyed. To drown suddenly in the ocean is a quicker kind of destruction, representing perhaps more directly an immediate crisis which must be immediately faced. The quicksand, or whatever it is, may represent the individual's own unconscious quotas. The individual is falling into himself. He is dying into his own introversion. He is losing contact with reality. So to drown has a sense of this loss of contact, loss of reality, loss of a balanced, organized, natural, suitable way of life. In the same way, different types of incidents may be played out by different persons. We know, for example, that in drama, 
there are about 43 plots, things that can happen to a person or a small group of persons. Yet out of these 43 plots, by their combination and by their various dressings, we have the entire dramatic literature of the race. Therefore, these themes are capable of eternal improvisation. But the basic skeleton is still extremely simple. And the basic pattern in dreams is extremely simple if we are able to reduce the compound to its essential skeletal form. The individual, for example, who dreams of elders, of older persons, who comes under the influence in dreams of wisdom or of learning or of some deep source of satisfaction or progress, it usually is then falling into the concept of the traditional factor in life. The individual who seeks wisdom, seeks understanding, seeks knowledge, is most likely to have this imparted in dream pattern through the elder or through the person to whom we symbolically associate the concept of experience. The old, therefore, if of a benign nature, represent experience. They represent the source of further knowledge, the source of leadership, of guidance, of help, or of protection. They may also, in some cases, imply that the individual needs to have a deeper traditional insight into his own nature. He needs to listen more acutely to the experience lessons which have been given to him in life. We hear the saying, you know, on television and radio, they had a program called The Voice of Experience. The Voice of Experience speaks in dreams, usually through the elder. Or if it does not speak through the elder, then it uh, speaks through the prelate, uh, for, for, through the person in high office, or in some benevolent dignity. Always the, uh, the experience pattern speaks down from a superior level of attainment of some nature, and would seek to assist us, guide us, or direct us. The voice of all the words or the thoughts exchanged with this elder, and the advice given must therefore be considered to be advice arising from experience if it is benevolent. If this elder is a sorcerer, a trickster, a magician, a witch, a warlock, a demon, then this elder is not giving us the voice of the experience of things but is speaking to us out of the prejudicial level of our own psychic development. It is telling us the things that we have built into consciousness that are wrong. Therefore, it is giving ill advice. It is betraying us. And it is telling us that we have already psychologically betrayed ourselves. That we are under the pressure of false values. And that in our dream, this false value, go governed by an intuitive perception, relieved of the pressure of false mental conjecture on our own part, is trying to reveal to us something that is wrong in its true light, in its light of being wrong. That what we thought was an opportunity is a temptation. What we believe to be a firm judgment was really a prejudice. What we believed to be strength of character was nothing but narrow-mindedness. Uh, these false advisings from the aged usually tell us that our experiences have not profited us well, that we have taken the wrong message, that we have not understood or applied the principles which nature intended. Young people, children, newborn babes, Things of this nature in dream symbolism have the meaning that they would symbolically suggest. The majority of persons in this world, consciously or unconsciously, invest their own future in their children. Whether they know it or not, they 
consider the child as the extension of themselves. The child, therefore, in the dream, is very often an extension of the person into the future. It is a symbol of a new beginning. It is a symbol of a new reaction to circumstance. In other words, the symbol of a new life. But it is a life of our own. And the child symbol usually is associated with some major hoped-for improvement of our condition. It is far more likely to represent a new life in us than to actually refer to children around us. The child also can and does symbolize the child in ourselves a creature that never dies regardless of the age that we achieve in physical years. Therefore, it can be both the child-likeness and the childishness. As the child-likeness, it is the purity, the innocence, the basic spiritual integrity of the person. But as childishness, it is immaturity, impractical thinking, perpetual adolescence, and the failure of the life to mature. Thus, we can determine some of these values from the way the child functions in the dream. If it is a beautiful child, a loving child, a wonderful child, a child that we have great hope for and have loved very deeply, and for which we feel the most admirable emotion, this child then probably does represent the child likeness or the new dream, or the hope of a better self with which we are involved. But if this child is delinquent, hateful, discordant, and a pain and sorrow to us in our dreams, then this child represents our childishness, our lack of maturity, and the streak of perpetual adolescence in our own nature, which is gravitating against the maturity of our lives. The loss of a child in a dream is usually the indication of the giving up of a hope or a project or an idea that is very dear to us. The loss of a child is the loss of an extension of ourselves into the future. It means that something which we deeply desire to accomplish now appears to be impossible or highly improbable. It may also, however, merely indicate that we have weakened our own resolution and have thus sacrificed the child. The effort to save a child from disaster usually indicates that we are trying to save a value in ourselves from being destroyed. In caring and uh, the care for and the health of the sick child is very often a definite indication of the fact that we are trying to bring through or reveal some secret value, but are having difficulty in helping this value to attain health in our compound constitution. To attend the funeral of a child generally means the loss of a psychic value, or the loss of some hope, or hope for beauty or reality in ourselves. The uh, problem of contact with various creatures may be of some interest to us at the moment. All creatures, again, divide into those that are friendly to man, dangerous to man, or can combine both attributes. Most animals do combine both attributes. But in various cultures, some animals are regarded as more benevolent than others. Therefore, in this symbolism, your cultural platform becomes of importance, also your legendary and traditional background. Uh, in, the, in Asia, the elephant, for example, has always been a symbol of wisdom. It has also been regarded as a fortunate symbol. To us in the Western world, this is not uh, so easily understood because our legendary and lore do not support entirely. But subconsciously, we still associate the elephant with erudition, with thoughtfulness, and with shrewdness of mind. We also associate it with mass, weight, and awkwardness. 
it becomes a symbol of imponderable difficulty. If this elephant is friendly, kindly, helpful, and in service to man, then this elephant may well represent the confused and comparatively ill-adjusted personality, uh, which becomes useful to us, but which is a large problem. It represents the elephant, is in difficult relations, represents large problems, heavy matters, weighty decisions. It also, however, suggests some kind of a thorough mental factor, that uh, these decisions by reason can be made. By greater thoughtfulness, the matter can be clarified. If the elephant is tame, the situation can be controlled. If, however, the elephant is rogue, is a destroyer, uh, b b battles its way through our lives, destroys the villages in which we live, and things of that nature, then the elephant becomes a symbol of the tyranny of mind, uh, when this mind is not adequately and properly controlled. It is mind as a destroyer. It is intellect as a corrupting or negating force. It may sometimes represent extreme self-will, which will destroy us. Any brilliant or powerful animal set upon destruction usually represents either intensity of emotion or the power of self-will and pride in their more devastating sense. To be identified with a powerful animal, to have a powerful animal as your ally or as your servant, uh, may well signify strong resources available to you. I know one case in which an individual had a powerful bear-like animal that accompanied him. And the, this animal went along very well. It was always his faithful friend until finally one day this bear was killed in the forest by a hunter who did not know who it belonged to. And of course the owner wept very pitifully in his dream and wished that the bear could come back to life. Actually, in the interpretation later, it, found that it was found that this bear represented his business, represented his instrument of control in society. It was the source of his prestige. It was the means of attaining the various ends. And his anxiety, which caused the dream, was the danger that this business uh, would be undermined and ultimately destroyed by a competitor who was therefore trying to shoot the bear. This type of dreaming can only be clearly understood if we know that the man is in this spot in his business and that he is under these pressures. We might have gotten some idea, of course, from the old association of the bears and the bulls with the stock market. Such associations frequently arise and cannot be all overlooked. I know a case of a dream in England in which a man had his pocket picked by an old lady with uh, one of these old-fashioned folding parasols, a black bonnet, and a passenger dress and coat, who had a very motherly, kindly appearance, but was an absolute pickpocket uh, and minor brigand. The symbolism would be meaningless to us, but it was very meaningful in the context of this man for he was out on the end of a limb in investment. He was hazarding too much money. He had gotten himself into a bad situation in trusting the wrong people in investment, and therefore was in grave danger of losing, and was greatly worried over this loss. And he therefore went back subconsciously to one of the most common symbols used in England to symbolize the English stock exchange which is known throughout the investing world as the little old lady of Threadneedle Street. That is the name of the London Stock Exchange. And this was the little old lady that was picking his pocket. The symbolism arose from perfectly natural association. But without a little help, the man probably would not have consciously bridged this symbolism. So here is another kind of basic lesson. The idea of nicknames. Of Puns upon words, 
and of uh, peculiar meanings associated with trade symbols with which we are commonly acquainted every day. We know that trade symbols now occur very frequently in dreams to take the place of the various activities or specialties with which they are involved. So that this situation may help us to determine perhaps the nature of an anxiety rising from occupation, investment, speculation, or uh, even uh, the general trends of commodities which may influence our lives. Now, the, the uh, continuation of the animal symbols would, of course, indicate that animals like the lion, signifying royalty, regality, leadership, the lion as the friend may mean not only a strength within ourselves, but also our ability to depend upon important support in our project. The lion turning on us may be a betrayal of both or either. An anxiety which will produce the symbolism will therefore cause the lion to become angry or dangerous. We find that uh, nearly all animals which have been domesticated actually represent friendship for man. The horse is a carrier of man and also a beast of burden for man. Therefore, the horse is frequently a body symbol. In the Chinese, for example, the old Chinese philosopher pointed out the foolish man who was walking down the road carrying the donkey on his back instead of riding the animal as a symbol of man being controlled by his body. Therefore, the horse, the natural bearer of burdens or the natural carrier of man, represents both his body and his personality. But by extension also, this horse can also intimate his career or the direction in which he is traveling. And if the horse is, in, uh, is injured, it may again be a symbol of the interruption of purpose or the fear of such interruption. Animals which are frequently around the home usually become symbols of persons or conditions in the home. And therefore, very often, Small children are represented by young animals, more often than by young children. It's interesting that when we dream of children, it probably means something else. But when we dream of kittens and puppies, it probably means children. One of the ornery qualities of dreams is their dislike to be literal. This seemingly is too simple and too easy, and would have not permitted any particular glory to have descended upon dear old Dr. Freud. Things had to be more complicated. Actually, home situations are not as often represented by home as we know or think of the term, as by some relationship of a friendly, jovial, or emotional nature with creatures, situations, or conditions. A mortgage or a heavy responsibility upon the home may very often take the form of fear or worry about clothing. Uh, clothing, by the way, plays quite an important part in dream symbolism. It is seldom a symbol of adornment in dreams. It is much more often a symbol of concealment. It may represent out-of-date attitudes, the person whose garments do not match his time. Uh, to see ourselves in poorly fashioned garments is to have subconscious awareness of misgivings or, mis or shortcomings in ourselves. To appear suddenly without garments is to be afraid of exposure or to be in the midst of a situation that might cause embarrassment. Uh, the individual who finds his garments suddenly soiled or injured and is trying desperately to clean them again is one whose conscience is probably not in the best of shape. He is having trouble trying to clean something out of his character or temperament, and his attitude towards it is affected by his fear that others will observe his difficulties, because applying to his clothing, it represents the part which he presents to another. If, however, he senses this uh, dirt, or lack of cleanliness upon his skin, 
then it is very much more likely to be a worry concerning his own personality in relationship to himself. The layers of circumstances move inward toward the essential nature of the individual. To discover a lost treasure usually indicates or means that the individual is in the presence of new ideas or new values which can be of great help to him in the future. To uh, have the dream of sickness is often a dream of self-pity. It often is part of that same symbolism of the small boy who, after having been slightly punished, turned to his mother and says, when I'm dead, you'll be sorry. And many individuals who want to hurt other people's feelings have dreams that they are lying blissfully in a coffin and all their enemies weeping over them. This, uh, this is a kind of revenge dream. A dream that has to do with getting even. And uh, one of the most certain methods by, man, by which man psychologically tries to get even with circumstances is by destroying himself. That is uh, one of his most common symbolical procedures. Birds have to do frequently with message, with travel, with insight, with uplifting ideas or thoughts, with guidance or leadership, and uh, uh, because they inhabit an airy region, they are likely to be associated with the mind and with thoughts. Therefore, the birds having their various meanings and their various symbols by their appearance to us or by their involvement in our affairs become symbolic of various attributes. If, for example, uh, we, see, we see an eagle and this eagle flies off and uh, invites us more or less to follow him, we'll follow it. This eagle representing as it does a bird of courage and also, to a lesser degree, a bird of prey, but to our thinking, usually a bird of courage, represents an invitation to a more courageous approach or quest for something that is valuable or needed. If, however, this bird turns upon us to hurt us, then uh, we are in danger of audacity. We are in danger of uh, developing the attributes of the talon and the claw and the beak by which our own inner life is likely to betray us. The owl, of course, is the symbol of wisdom and also of mystery and for the search for hidden things. And very often, uh, because of its association with the city of Athens, a symbol of philosophy. The raven or the other talking birds uh, very often signify intuitive experiences or suggest that uh, advice or needed information is likely to reach us or has reached us, but we have not yet been able to interpret it. We haven't been able to make the thoughts of other people talk. But if they do talk, they may lead us out of our difficulties. Caged birds represent usually limitations upon our love, our thoughts, and our affections. Uh, birds uh, which are associated with water have much more tendency to be associated with our emotional life. Those with air have to do largely with our mental life. The swan, of course, is one of the most ancient symbols uh, of human mystical insight and appears in this form constant, constantly in Western symbolism. And in the Japanese symbolism and Chinese, the Mandarin duck which never leaves its mate and never has but one, is the symbol of fidelity. And in the experience of these people might very well come through with that kind of meaning. Uh, the Oriental peoples also worship the crane or the stalk, which likewise had considerable effect in European thinking. And this bird was the symbol of patience, because it would stand quietly on one foot for hours, watching the little pool of water and waiting for lunch. Uh, and it would be able to do this for uh, perhaps a whole day without moving. Therefore, that patience, quietude, relaxation, and watchful waiting are indicated in this particular situation. And out of the old traditional legendary lore of our people, these thoughts come. 
Symbols of battle are usually symbols of conflict in ourselves, or conflict with those around us. To be wounded in battle is to be injured in such conflict, and therefore to feel psychic injury. The person who is wounded, injured, or in an accident is telling us a story of psychic injury. He is telling us that in some way, in the course of living, he has passed through a psychological accident which has temporarily uh, interfered with his function. Uh, symbols which have to do with arrows or with uh, various weapons are very often quite interesting. Uh, weapons generally represent the abilities of an adversary. They represent powers or conditions which others present to us to which we have no ready answer. A duel very often represents a struggle of two attitudes or two levels of function. A duel frequently indicates social struggle. It represents a situation in which an individual is out of harmony with his social strata or perhaps is trying to bluff and is therefore in grave danger to get, of getting into difficulty. A fight or a very heated and unpleasant argument with other persons also means usually psychic stress, discord within ourselves, and arguments between the departments of our own psychic life. Religious dreams of various kinds are also interesting and meaningful to us. The dream of being in church or some experience of that nature is generally either a symbol of internal integration or else the need of it and the impulse of the person to seek some form of solace. It is uh, a solution through faith or through hope, recommending itself to the consciousness of the individual. The rituals of religion are usually indications of protection or of the availability of insight. For wherever religion appears constructively, it is insight. It represents a contribution from the basic consciousness awareness of the being. Where religion emerges in a dream as a persecuting or destroying force, then it warns us of prejudice, and the danger of prejudice arising in our own psychic organization, likely as a result of our own attitude to turn upon us and use our convictions to injure ourselves. Therefore, these convictions must be basically wrong. But wherever a thing normally good takes on an evil appearance, then we have misunderstood or misused a natural fact, and have therefore come under the, might say, the displeasure of that fact, a situation which is being revealed to us. Visions of celestial beings or of divine persons uh, generally represent one of two things. Either that the individual is in an extremity, and therefore is making a very strong plea to his basic faith. He is trying to reach into the source of some kind of peculiar and definite strength or need. Or else the individual is in the presence of a strong claim upon his life for some dedication of purpose. Frequently a person under very heavy responsibility has a divine purpose dream which assists him to carry his burden because he comes to realize or believe that he is fulfilling a spiritual need in his own life. And if uh, the general pattern of this circumstance is benevolent, then this responsibility is proper. If the revelation takes on dogmatic or despotic attitude, then his own willfulness or his own stubbornness is forcing him to stay with a situation that is otherwise not necessary or proper to him. Religious dreams in general represent man reaching for security in time of stress. Therefore, both in waking and in sleeping, emergency nearly always brings strong religious impact. Now, there are all kinds of adventure dreams in which persons pass through various episodes, similar to those in the mythologies of ancient peoples. Uh, usually, in the normal type of adventure dream, the individual involved becomes a kind of heroic person, and the dream becomes a hero dream. This hero dream is not different from almost any of the legends in the Age of Fables. 
It may be paralleled in the Arabian Nights or in the wanderings of Odysseus. But wherever the person engages in a series of heroic exploits, we find the indication, psychologically speaking, that the person is fighting against adversaries psychologically represented by the enemy in the dream. The dragon represents one of the most compound symbols in man's experience. In China, it is a good symbol. In Western civilization, it is not a good symbol generally, although under some conditions it may take on a benevolence. The reason it is good in China probably is because the Chinese mind has been so deeply involved in mysticism uh, that the internal or the unconscious content has become a thing of benevolence. In Western man, the unconscious is a thing of danger. The dragon as a space symbol generally represents the mysterious total power lurking at the source of man, a power of which he is afraid, a power which he does not dare to express, a power which he can scarcely hope to ever understand. Therefore, the dragon is the unconscious and the mystery. To display the dragon is to overcome the fear of the unknown. Uh, to harness the dragon is to make use of the unknown to the advancement of known purposes. And to tame the dragon means to lose fear of the unknown, or to transform it into some useful force. Other chimera or monstrous characters in symbolism include the unicorn. The unicorn, this mysterious horse with a horn on its forehead, is for a great many persons the symbol of transmutation. It appears in dreams as a solution symbol, usually. Wherever it appears, the matter can be handled. It is a promise of solution. It is a promise of the necessary insight. And it usually is uh, an announcement that the situation needed will appear in due course, or be recognized in due course, by the person who has the dream. Various um, characters and figures and symbols from the age of fable, like the harpies and the sirens, mermaids, nymphs, and things of that nature, representing elementary forces, have a tendency to indicate appetite or rudimentary emotions within man. They have to do with instincts and impulses. And most of your submundane forms in dreams are impulse symbolisms. Uh, they represent impulses or urges to do things, many of them not easily explainable, and to fall under their influence as Odysseus so nearly did, or to be turned into the swine as the sailors of Odysseus were by Circe the magician. Now, this uh, type of symbolism means impulse taking over, means imagination or psychism dominating the light. Going on from one type of symbolism to another, we have trees as the emblems of growth. We have flowers as the emblems of unfoldment in Asia and of kindliness or thoughtfulness or wisdom in the West. Flowers are usually immortality and generation symbols. And uh, uh, the interpretation of them, again, is not difficult if the person immediately awaking tries to uh, tie his dream to the previous instance in life which have just preceded sleep. By this means, many symbols, otherwise difficult to understand, can first be generally discovered and then more specifically analyzed. The first step is to determine the broad classification of the dream. The second, the major elements. And finally, the consideration of such details as may be comprehended. If this process is carried on carefully, and thoughtfully, the individual will be able to solve the majority of his dreams. Those more complicated may further need the cooperation of an analyst. But for the most part, man can do what he was intended to do. The dreams were meant for him. Therefore, the power to use them is in him if he knows how to find that power. So we hope in the course of this series to help you to find some more answers to this subject but the time is up for the night, so we have to stop.